Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining this very special event which is part of a six-part series with our partner New Profit where we'll be talking about re-architecting the future through philanthropy and social entrepreneurship. Firstly, I hope you and your loved ones are all keeping well during what continues to be a challenging time for so many people. Our intention at Worth is to create conversations that help inspire and inform and activate our community, many of whom are investors and funders, entrepreneurs and leaders who want to leave a positive impact on the world and help to create a more inclusive and equal economy and society for the benefit of everyone. And we call that Worth Beyond Wealth. So we hope you enjoy this session and we hope you find it thought provoking and valuable. I'm Juliet Scott Croxford, CEO at Worth Media and your moderator for the next hour. And I'm delighted to be joined by our special guest, Tulane Montgomery, Managing Partner at New Profit. Hey, Tulane. Hey, Juliet. Good to be here with all of you. It's How great you to see you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and, and thanks to everyone that's, that's joined. Uh, I can already see some activity on the chat, which is fantastic. This series is all about breakthrough impact. Philanthropy, like other, face, other sectors facing a moral reckoning on racial equity, continues to have a vital role to play in creating an America that lives up to the promise of its founding ideals. But we must overcome the, the bias and the barriers that have existed in philanthropy for too long if we hope to unlock the ideas, the talent, and the collaborations that can drive us towards a more equitable future. Recent research has shown that entrepreneurs of colour and from underinvested communities receive a disproportionately small fraction of total funding and philanthropy, even though they are often the most proximate to many of the systemic challenges that we face uh, and have the expertise and systems focused approaches needed to address them. Bridging the racial funding gap for entrepreneurs and other leaders, which can unleash a new wave of progress against entrenched inequities will take a shift in mindset amongst funders first and foremost. So in this first session, we're really exploring the mindset question and the shifts that we need to make in order to re-architect philanthropy for a better, more inclusive and equitable future for everyone. So we're delighted to collaborate with our partner, New Profit, in this initiative and very excited to have Tulane Montgomery, managing partner at New Profit, join us to kick off this important series. A few housekeeping rules before we get started. Please, please, please do use the, the chat function. It's at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can use that to type in questions and comments um, and any, any questions you have for Tulane. Uh, we can unmute you as we go, or if you prefer to stay anonymous, that's fine. You can send them to Worth Media or Juliet Scott Croxford, uh, and I can weave them into the conversation. Um, you should be muted on entry into this session as well, uh, but if you do have a question to ask, <clears throat> our producer Molly McLoon will unmute you uh, at the right time. So we're just going to run a short video on New Profit before we get stuck into the conversation with Tulane. In some ways, we are so far apart as a nation, but we really need each other now more than ever. We are at a critical juncture in our country. The potential for change is amazing. We have to think about how we break through in philanthropy, how we truly share power. Think venture capital for social impact. We find great entrepreneurs. We give them a deal partner, we give them unrestricted funding for multiple years. We help them scale up their enterprises, and the result is really big breakthrough impact. When we look at our investments over the last 12 years, those organizations have grown four times greater than the average nonprofit in our sector. But those are very traditional ways of talking about success. What we're excited about are the new operating models and the systems entrepreneurs that are redefining impact in our sector. As an investor, I look for three things. The people, process, and performance. And at New Profit, you get each. In addition, you get this incredible community of social entrepreneurs so that great ideas are able to scale and have huge impact. I may have the resources, but I've realized over time and experience and with New Profit's help that I'm not close enough to the challenges. The people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. We need to reimagine the way we do this work to be done with the voices of all of our people. Students, parents, teachers, they know it's time to rethink schooling. The future of learning is coming. How do we make sure it's accessible to all? 
ensure that everyone, no matter their background or identity, can equitably access education and job opportunities in order to thrive. If you want to make a real difference in education, workforce development, and poverty alleviation policy, then New Profit is for you. If you're ready for a thoughtful partner to bring you through a rigorous process that brings focus to your mission and helps you scale, New Profit is for you. If you are a philanthropist and you want your money to really work for you and to have impact, New Profit is for you. Imagine if we lived in a world where no matter what you looked like, where you were born, where you lived, you had the opportunity and the pathway to live a prosperous, joyful, productive, connected life. That's worth the work. The future we imagine is the future we can create together. So Lane, let's, um, let's jump straight in. I, I want to go straight into a, a quick fire round to get to know you. Sure. Um, well, firstly, welcome. Um, yeah. What's your theme fight song right now? You know, I'm a big music buff. Uh, so it, it changes. But today, this morning, it is Gladys Knight. I've got to use my imagination. Um, <laughs> the music of it, the musicality of it, the tempo of it, and the words. You know, when it's dark around me, I've got to envision something better and greater than what I see right now. So that is absolutely my theme song for the moment. I love it. Uh, and, and also connected to what we opened with as well. Yeah. Your historical figure, uh, who's a spiritual guide for you in this moment, mm -hmm. or, or, or certainly something, someone that you can anchor to? Yeah, um, I, I really reflect often on my ancestors. So again, there's a lot uh, that come to mind. Ella, Ella Baker is really guiding me these days. Her career spanned over 50 years. She worked all over the country. She wasn't restricted to one region. She organized hundreds of thousands of people to engage in the um, voting process, even when it was at risk to them. Uh, so she, and she did it with joy and with style. So Ella Baker. Nice. Mm -hmm. And what's the first thing that you're gonna do when, um, when sort of the, the quarantine restrictions are lifted? Oh God, I'm gonna go to hear one of my favorite DJs and dance. <laughs> I'm so clear about that. Dancing in, in my home is fine, but you know, I'm ready for the next alternative when it is safe to do so. <laughs> and and so it's been an extraordinary year on so many levels um, and an extraordinary challenging one at that. What's the most surprising thing that you've seen play out in the philanthropic space during this time? You know, it's been surprising and frankly encouraging to me to see that people who have spent like years and even decades operating with a particular mental model um, have been willing to radically shift the way they see the world. Um, we'll talk a bit about that in our conversation, Juliet, I'm sure, but uh, it's actually been encouraging that uh, people are willing to and capable of transformation in how they see things and therefore what they do. And what's one thing that you're excited about right now, even amidst all of the challenges that we're faced with? I mean, I am excited about, there's a lot that I'm excited about. I'm excited about how um, there's been a collective recognition that many of the things we hold dear, that they're fragile and that they're precious and that they require our attention, whether it's uh, our you know, civic infrastructure, our democracy, um, the, the right to vote, the opportunity to vote, um, whether it is the strength of communities and um, people are taking health, whether it's our health <laughs> and how we show up in community impacts the health of one another. I'm noticing that people are across the board recognizing that the things that we hold dear, we actually can't take for granted and that they require our attention in order to sustain. Um, and, and, and I think that is encouraging, even though it doesn't come without some struggle attached. And, and how have you sustained yourself during this time? What have been, what have been the things that you've kind of yeah. clung on to for a sort of healthy mind as well as a healthy body? Absolutely. I mean, I talked about ancestors, so I've been, you know, definitely studying and reading and revisiting a lot of the wisdom, whether it's, you know, my great grandmother and the things that she told me, or it's the writings of Malcolm X or the writings of James Baldwin or Toni Morrison, who's now an ancestor. You know, I have been really focusing on uh, wisdom. Um, in, in all its forms and studying it. And obviously meditation is something that is also important. There's so much noise and there's so much collective anxiety and fear. So meditation has been an important way to just root so I can yeah. really be present for the moment that I have ahead. And music. 
Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. Absolutely. That's always music. Always. <laughs> um, be before we go into the first part of this, this conversation, and, and there are going to be a couple of questions from the audience, actually. So we'll be, we'll be put, putting up a poll question shortly, um, just, to, just to sort of set the scene of where we are. If you could, Tulane, what are the specifics on inclusive impact within the scope of new profits work? Because I know um, you, you did a study on this and I think it, that it revealed some very interesting uh, data points. But mm -hmm. yeah, just talk to us about the specifics of that. Absolutely. And I just want to just start, Juliet, by saying that, you know, on this call, we're really inviting folks who are in the room with us to consider an ideological transformation when it comes to philanthropy. You know, what we are going to discuss, what inclusive impact is about, is not about sort of an incremental shift from business as usual in philanthropy. It's about really, you know, going to the root of the thing, uprooting what doesn't serve us and transforming the system. Um, and doing so by recognizing that expertise, knowledge, assets, talent, ideas, and solutions, all of those things reside in community in ways that um, we often ignore or overlook based on current philanthropic practices. So, so to be specific about inclusive impact, inclusive impact is a multi-tiered systems change effort that really is designed to um, increase the amount of capital that is made available to leaders of color and leaders who are proximate to communities and to challenges. Um, so when I say proximate, what do I mean? I mean people who have either through their lived experiences or their choices or their service um, built deep, intimate knowledge, awareness, and regard for communities and issue areas. So you can be you can be proximate to the American legal system, you know, if you have been directly impacted, if you've been incarcerated, if you've been an advocate for the incarcerated, if you have been in a family where incarceration has impacted your life. That's proximity to the issue area. And that means that you have expertise that enables you to design brilliant solutions that others just would not see because they don't have access to the data. So inclusive impact features a capital raise. We are currently raising $100 million to support social impact leaders, um, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous leaders who are in some way advancing equity and opportunity. Um, it's unrestricted funding because one of the things we learned in the research that we did about a year and a half ago is that philanthropy has systematically failed to recognize and invest in proximate leaders and leaders of color. We learned that at the time that we did the study, about 30% of the US population identified as Black or Latinx, or sorry, 10%, excuse me, of organizations, nonprofit organizations, were led by Black and Latinx individuals. But Juliet, only 4% of philanthropy in the US, only 4% was allocated to Black and Latinx leaders. And if you were to look more closely at the features of that 4%, that's where it gets even more troubling because you see highly restricted dollars. You see funders dictating to leaders what models they believe will work and not necessarily prioritizing or believing proximate leaders when they say, this is actually what my community needs to address this issue that we all care about. Yeah. So that dynamic, that, that unacceptable norm is what I call it, is something that inclusive impact is committed to, you know, radically transforming. Because I want to remind folks in the call, you know, if you look at the etymology of the word philanthropy, philanthropy, the root of the word is to love humankind. That's actually what we're here for. And I think now more than ever, remembering our origin story as a field is important. So we, we our origin story is one of love. And so, you know, my mother always taught me that you have to teach people how to love you. <laughs> that means you have to say, you know, this is actually what works for me and, and this actually doesn't work for me. And, and now the love is working all right. So I believe that philanthropy has to do our own version of learning how to love the communities that we are investing in and making grants towards and wanting to serve ultimately. Capital raise of 100 million is the one piece. And then the other thing I'll say, uh, Juliet, is that we're also building a multiracial coalition um, we believe that this country has never seen a multiracial coalition of people standing shoulder to shoulder, donors, impact leaders, advisors, academics, in, on behalf of scaling investment in proximate leaders. It's never happened. And so it's time to try something that uh, is dramatically different from what we've done that really honors the expertise that proximate leaders have. 
And I, I love, I love the, the, the sort of the root of this, which is the love for humankind. And, and I think so much of this connects with the sense of community and collaboration and the collective power that we, we can all yield by coming together. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, you know, we want people on this call to really sort of think about this and also to, to join this coalition. When we talk about philanthropists, Tulane, we often, we often hear, um, we often hear about very wealthy philanthropists and there are some very well-known ones out there. But, but in this context, it, it, it's, it's, it's anyone that wants to uh, make impact or, or give however, however large or small, right? That's right, absolutely. Philanthropy is not um, uh, restricted to the wealthy, right? Uh, economically wealthy or the economic elite, right? I mean, uh, we all have a role to play. That's part of what inclusive impact is all about. It's about building this multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-economic, that's not really a phrase, but I'll use it now. It's about creating a space where people of different identities and experiences all rally behind scaling up the investment in and support for proximate leaders. So absolutely, um, there's a role. Philanthropy, I mean, you know, we all engage in philanthropy of some sort. There is some way all of us do something that is meant to in some way show love to humankind. And again, that's the origin story of philanthropy that I'm, I'm excited for us to come back to. Yeah, I, I want to put up the first polling question now. Um, so, so the, the the first question we have for the, for for the audience is whether the events of twenty twenty have led you to change the way you think about your approach to philanthropy. Um, just a, a quick answer: yes, yes, completely, somewhat, or not at all. Uh, and I think that will be interesting as we talk about the impact during this time. While we just get those answers to Lane. I'd, lo I'd love to hear just briefly about your background and how you how you came into this space. Sure, sure. I actually um, had never imagined I would be in philanthropy um, because I don't know. I had a whole lot of uh, assumptions about it. Right. Um, I actually started my career in business strategy consulting. I um, then moved into social entrepreneurship because I just have been really passionate about how can we, there's so many brilliant solutions out there and so many great leaders. And I just, I just don't quite buy that we can't figure out how to solve our most entrenched problems, you know, with all the genius that exists out in this, in this world. So I have had just this fire in my belly uh, to find great leaders and find great ideas and support them in growing. And whether that's been as a strategy consultant, whether that's been as a social entrepreneur myself, whether that's been in the policy space, which is a space I've been in, uh, or whether now it's in philanthropy, my mission is to kind of unlock the incredible talent and genius that is abundant, but somehow hasn't quite translated into equitable systems for our country and for this world. Um, so that's high level. I, I think the other thing I'll say quickly is that um, I've been a social entrepreneur, but I also am an artist and a creator. And so I'm a playwright and a cellist. And I do think that music and the, the written word and poetry inform how I think about strategy when it comes time to do systems change. There's sort of something about improvisation and adaptation that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that's kind of drawing on, you know, the music and the poetry in my life. That's interesting, and 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 because I always think the um, the creative aspect, uh, there's some sort of it, it gives you a bit more of a resilience to change as well. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so th so these are the the results. Forty three percent yes com have completely uh, changed their approach to philanthropy. Um, Forty eight percent somewhat. Nine percent not at all. So um, it, it's interesting to see a lot of people have been rethinking um, mm -hmm. their approach to to this over over the course of the last. Eight, eight months or so. Um, there, there's a question that's come in, which I think leads us nicely into this next next part, which is how has COVID-19 impacted philanthropy? Absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously COVID-19 has laid bare structural imbalances that are not sustainable for a thriving society or a thriving economy, right? Um, and I do believe pre-COVID, there are there were a whole set of um, philanthropic initiatives where uh, things, um, there wasn't necessarily a collective awareness about the need for investment in say um, health, public health systems, um, or for the need in, or for investment in technology infrastructure, 
right? And now with COVID, there's a set of awarenesses that have been lifted up because there's just, you know, we are all facing a storm together. We're not all in the same boat, <laughs> but we're all facing a storm together. I would also say that philanthropy, I've been encouraged by seeing some, not enough, but some philanthropists um, get much more uh, urgent and efficient about unlocking resources. You know, I've seen some funders simplify their application process for grants. I've seen some funders um, do more outreach to their grantees to get feedback on how they can be more efficient and more adaptive. So it's not enough, it's not yet the norm, but I have seen sections of philanthropy respond by saying we as a field have to get better at unlocking resources, not only smarter, but also faster to those in need. And my hope is that that sense of urgency that COVID has created, that it can carry over so that we just can continue to get better at efficient, rapid, adaptive, customized grant making and philanthropy. So it's not such a, sometimes it's a bit too, there's the burden of labor that falls on the uh, institutional organization. It's, it's a bit imbalanced. And I'll, we'll talk a bit about some ideas yeah. we'll about how to change that. And it, it's interesting that you said we're not all in the same boat because I think when when this all happened, there was that rhetoric which we're all in the same boat. It's like no, we're we're all experiencing COVID, but we're we're not in the same boat in terms of the the, the inequities that transpired. And and I think you know it it's not just COVID nineteen, but um, the, the the racial justice movement and the devastating murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and, and countless others, and then obviously the, the, the devastating verdict this week. How, how has that played a role? Well, you know, what I've seen, Juliet, um, there is a, there's a collective pain, really, that I've seen. Um, and it's not restricted to those who have been labeled as disenfranchised. Um, I, in, in some ways, reject some of the labels that we put on communities, particularly communities of color. Um, however, there's, a, there's this wondering and pain that I am seeing as I'm talking to philanthropists and funders. People are, um, you know, upset about the state of our country and the level of fragmentation, the level of um, pain that is so evident. And it's unclear what to do, right? What I've, what I've heard a lot of is, I want to do something about uh, racial equity. I don't know what to do. Um, I don't know who to talk to. I don't know where to go. I don't know what a smart uh, investment or smart grant making portfolio would look like. So there's a real desire for and hunger for tools, uh, referrals, networks, recommendations. Um, it's been really, the, the pace and level of it has been, I've never seen anything like it in the 10 years that I've been in philanthropy. Um, and folks who've been in philanthropy longer than me have, have also said they've never seen it in their career. So people want to know what to do and they feel like they don't quite know what to do. And sometimes there's a sense of being stuck that I've observed. Right. And so sort of going into that, um, that, that sort of sense of being stuck and some of the barriers in our mind, and we talked about that sort of elemental definition of philanthropy and, and loving humankind. Mm -hmm. how, how do we return to that? Because it, it does feel like there, there's so many, um, and, and, and obviously the political sphere obviously clouds this as well, but mm -hmm. how do we return mm -hmm. to that, that elemental definition? I think it's really about, I mean, going back to, you know, you have to teach people how to love you. I think we have to learn how to listen. We have to create structures, protocols, and processes that require us as funders and philanthropists to actively listen to and learn from our grantees and from the communities that we in some way want to support. You know, so the idea that I can, because of a particular educational pedigree or economic status, that I am going to inherently have all the data I need to design the most effective solutions for a community that I do not live in and do not intimately know, there's something inherently flawed in that design model, right? There's something missing in that logic model. And if we think about how we operate in business and the private sector, you know, the idea that you could build, you could build a product for a, a customer without having real knowledge of that customer, without listening to what that customer says she or he prefers, that, that we, don't, we don't even entertain that, 
when mm -hmm. it comes to sort of the private sector or the business marketplace. But when we move into the social impact space, we sort of operate as if it's even possible really for people who don't have meaningful engagement or proximity to a community to know enough about community to in isolation design solutions for that community. So I think returning to love of humanity starts with creating structures that not only listen to proximate leaders, but reward and learn from their advice and input. I'm not saying that we as philanthropists remove ourselves from the equation. I'm saying that we want to expand the number of seats at the table. We want to expand. So if you are a community organizer, if you are a classroom teacher, if you are a school administrator, and I'm a philanthropist who in some way is wanting to invest in ed reform and improving student outcomes, well, I, I feel like I better get, have a way of talking to the people who are implementing what I'm funding, who are experiencing what I'm funding, and who can tell me whether or not the impact that I aspire to support is actually happening on the ground. There's a real psychology around this, I think. It's interesting because we, we, when we were speaking earlier this week, uh, there was a session that, that we did with Wade Davis last week, who's um, head of inclusion at Netflix, um, talking about diversity, mm -hmm. equity mm -hmm. and inclusion, and the importance of self-reflection and mm -hmm. the importance of knowing who you are, where you're from, and the, the power that you yield in comparison to others. Um, and, I, and I think there's just an interesting kind of rep, introspective piece of work we all have to do around uh, reflecting on ourselves and then sort of thinking about that. Uh, and you touched on proximity. Yes. Uh, but but how, do we, how, do we, how do we get closer to that? Because often that sort of lack of proximity, I think, prevents people from doing that. Yeah. I love that question um, and think about this a lot. When I think about a pathway towards justice, and Brian Stevenson actually talks about this a lot, so shout out to Brian Stevenson, um, the great Brian Stevenson. Um, he talks about one of the first steps towards justice, equity, is truth telling. And I think the first step is we have to tell ourselves and each other as philanthropists the truth, right? And you know, think about how, you, for, for those who are in the call with us, think about you know, how you feel when I say the word charity. Just sit for a minute and see how that feels in your body. Now, investment. Think about how that feels and sort of what parts of your mind get sort of, you know, woken up, right? And there's actually interesting research, brain research about that different parts of our brain get stimulated when we hear the word charity versus investment. And I would offer that, as I said a moment ago, that there's something about a charity framework that I think just does not serve philanthropy. That if you are chair, if you're providing charity, there's a way that you have defined yourself as other you've defined yourself as distant, it's almost the opposite of proximity, right? So to your question, I think one of the first things we have to do, Juliet, to get to proximity is we have to, I believe, get rid of the notion of charity because we are not other. We are connected, we are dependent on one another. We must learn from those we seek to support in order to understand how to support them. And charity just gets us all confused and we start thinking we know best and because we have the capital we're maybe smarter or more inclined to have the smarter idea. It just gets in the way. So first, throw out charity. Next, create spaces for truth telling. As a philanthropist, when is the last time that you facilitated a space where all things were discussable with your grantees? Create a space where you can actually hear the impact of your protocols, your criteria, your procedures, your reporting requirements. When's the last time that you heard the truth about the impact of your practice. And I would offer, all of us know as successful adults, if you're not getting feedback on the impact of what you're doing, the likelihood that you have blind spots is high. So that same principle applies in the social impact space. So create spaces and build relationships that are deep and trusted enough that you can be told the truth as a philanthropist. That's After, such, yeah, please. That's such good advice. And I, I, I did just, um, uh, I, I'd love to hear what um, our attendees think about the words that come to mind in charity. Someone said giving, helping, money, gifts, tax efficient. Um, or I've also just put investment, what, what words come to mind investment. So please do share that. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so I think that these steps, and, and, I'm, and I love these chat, the, the chat and the, like what comes to mind and what people are thinking about, but you know, I think there's not, this is not to say that there is something evil or negative necessarily about a charitable spirit. 
It's to say that if the goal is systems change, transformation, charity is insufficient. Okay. Charity works in, a, charity at best can service reform at best. It cannot support transformation and systems change. So that's why I'm making a distinction between charity and philanthropy in this case. And it's, and it's great. Jennifer Emin has said actually investment equals to have a value. And I think um, you don't think of that necessarily when you're thinking about charity. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. So Jennifer's point, having value. Like, so if you are investing, you're recognizing that you bring value to the table and what you're investing in has value. Absolutely. Charity implies that the sort of recipient just yeah. needs to be helped or saved is in some way broken and needs fixing as opposed to this, a very different orientation around solutions and assets. But please, yeah, I think you... So we, we, we've touched a bit on systems focused approaches. How do we be, be move beyond the cult of the programs towards systems focused approaches? Mm. One, um, I, that's a great question. I think it's important when you're wanting to look at systems change versus sort of incremental reform, you got to look at what we call the six conditions of systems change. There's a wonderful article called The Water of Systems Change that I highly recommend. We can maybe follow up and send a link to yeah. folks. Um, and in that article, the six conditions of systems change are articulated, and, and I'll quickly name them. They're really important for the philanthropists in the room who care about transformation and equity. First, you have to tell the truth about the um, um, implicit yet poor and powerful elements of a system. So the mental models, the beliefs that drive the system design. You know, Do you have a system that believes that certain groups have certain assets and others do not? Do you have a system based on the premise that certain groups are trustworthy and others are not? You know, really take a look at and interrogate the mental models that inform the system. Another implicit but powerful element of a system are the power dynamics. What are the existing power dynamics? Who holds power? Is the power transparent and evident to all parties? Or are there hidden power mechanisms that operate? Another implicit but important element of systems change is relationships and networks. That is key in philanthropy. All of this applies to philanthropy, right? Mm -hmm. So we talked a bit about the mental models that inform philanthropy. We're talking a little bit about the power dynamics that drive philanthropy. We also should talk about the relationships that drive philanthropy. Some people have a social capital in philanthropy that benefits them when it's time to receive funding. Other people, typically proximate leaders and leaders of color, often don't have the same networks. And so they are perceived as higher risk because they are not as familiar to the people who keep the capital and resource. The next pieces to consider are the more explicit aspects of a system, the structures, the policies, the capital flow. We tend to look at the explicit elements of a system and ignore the implicit elements, yet the implicit drive everything that we can see, touch, and track. So again, mental models, power dynamics, relationships, policies, capital flow, and um, people, like sort of uh, employment, yeah. like who gets what job and, and what have you. So I didn't say that perfectly on the last one, but hopefully you get a sense of it. It's six conditions of systems change. And the water of systems change is the article where these conditions are broken down and defined in more detail, if anyone's interested in them. And uh, we, we, we've just shared that actually. Thank you, Sam. Sam's just shared that on, on the chat. Um, often when we speak to the worth community um, and, and, and many of whom are investors or, or philanthropists, mm -hmm. we often hear this sort of struggle with feeling like everything in the country is being boiled down to sort of them versus us. And, yeah. and they're, they're often portrayed as the enemy in, in, yes. this, um, in, in terms of the progress of philanthropy. How mm -hmm. true is that? I'll say this, this country, you know, um, so many things that are, are brilliant and exciting and so many things that are sort of not yet realized, right? And one of them is that we tend to go binary when it just does not serve us. The truth is that inclusive impact and new profits work is all about building a multiracial coalition of people with different experiences and economic backgrounds standing shoulder to shoulder. Now that's never been done. Philanthropy has never before come together to scale support for proximate leaders, but we have the opportunity to do that right now because people are collectively aware and there's a collective struggle that's happening right now. I would say, you know, a big part of my work is working with philanthropists, investors, and donors who care deeply about equity and opportunity, 
um, who want to operate valuing proximity, who don't necessarily quite yet have the relationships to do so. And they talk about this dynamic, like, should I be you know, made to feel ashamed for my wealth? Should I be made to be treated as if I'm not trustworthy? Um, and this is what I'll say. Race is a construct, right? Especially if we talk about racial equity, right? Race is a construct, it's made up. I, Juliet, may have more uh, genetically in common with you than I do with a, a person who appears as black race identity. We now know that, we have the science to know that the genetic indicators that generate racial identity are micro, micro percentage of our overall genetic code. It's a construct, it's made up. We can point to the historical documents that show that our founders, you know, when they wanted to reconcile their love of liberty and love of freedom, but their desire for free labor, they had to end their love of the Lord. They were Christians, right? And so they, they wanted to do right, but they also wanted to impose slavery. They had to come up with a construct that built a bridge that enabled that. The construct was race. And notes on the state of Virginia is a document where Jefferson introduced the construct and idea of an inferior race of people that laid the foundation for, for chattel slavery in the United States. My point in bringing that up is human beings made this up. And so if human beings made this up, that means that human beings can create the alternative constructs that are actually inclusive and make space for all of us. That's actually possible. And because things are breaking down in the ways they are, that actually presents an incredible opportunity that we've never seen in our lifetime to reinvent and create this multiracial, multiethnic coalition of people who stand shoulder to shoulder and all have value and all have place and voice. We believe that's possible and there is absolutely space. So if you are a donor who's experienced this sense of being treated like the enemy, listen, we at New Profit invite you to come join us. We want you to join us, be part of this coalition. There is space for you. We will value and see you and you'll have the chance to build proximity with people who are the same and different from you towards the greater good of this country. And I, I think Tulane, um, this is this is such a rich conversation and it, and it and it's it, 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 it's 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 incredibly it's incredibly deep and I, and i think going back to the the roots is is so essential particularly because the systemic problems feel so huge yeah, um, yeah. but i do and and i think philanthropy to some degree has mm -hmm. has failed to address them up until now but it does feel mm -hmm. different now it there, there yeah. does feel like there's this, there's this there's this moment in time which, which i feel others feel which is um there there is an opportunity that we have right now to really sort of shift and create progress in this space and to drive for a more inclusive equitable society for the benefit of everyone and, and a more inclusive equitable economy for everyone mm -hmm. do, do, do you agree i do i mean i i couldn't i mean even though i am disheartened and sometimes even heartbroken by what i see um i am also at the same time it's a bit of a, a trip <laughs> because i'm holding <laughs> like a kind of a broken heart and, and an open heart and excitement about what's possible i mean i even you know juliet would ask you when you are engaging with members of the worth community you know my sense is that people are asking wanting you know committing to change even if they don't know exactly what it's going to look like or what it will require that there is this like desire for things to be better and a readiness to do the work is, is that what you're seeing uh, it is, and, and and the the dialogue has shifted. Um, I mean, we've always focused on this notion of worth beyond wealth, and and our community are you know do tend to uh, that they are affluent, they are successful, they are influential, mm -hmm. but they you know whilst wealth creation and business innovation is important to them, mm -hmm. what's of equal if not more important is how do they leave a positive impact on the world. Sure. How do they how do they lead and live a life with purpose and how do they connect? You know, there's a much more there's much more focus on values and life and actually using wealth as a vehicle to for that, um, mm -hmm. which I think has shifted. That's always sort of been our focus over the last sort of two years through our transformation. But it's a, it's it's definitely shifted over the last six months. And you can see people. Um, people want to learn. People have a hunger to learn. People have a yes. hunger to connect, um, and this sort of sense of community and getting getting to understand these issues, but also the proximity piece, I think, is critical in that. 
Absolutely. That I mean, and that that is encouraging to me, right? Hearing what you just shared about the Worth community is encouraging, and it's just as true as any of the hard stories we hear in the news. Like so, we so so I I work hard to, and, and at New Profit we make space. You know, we, we pay attention to the good news as well as the bad news. <laughs> like they're both they're both legitimate and require our attention. So I think that's encouraging. And 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 I would say again, you know, part of what we've begun to build with inclusive impact. We, we started to build this coalition, you know, we have, you know, we had an incredible event in February of this year um, where we had, you know, donors and philanthropists and social impact leaders of color and white social impact leaders and we all came together and we told the truth and we designed different structures together and we took steps towards justice and equity and there's space to do that. We, we know what is possible to do. We've done it at, at, a, at a micro scale and we're now building out a larger effort and really are excited to work with you, Juliet, and the Worth community to expand and scale up this coalition of leaders and philanthropists. I, I want to move, and, and we're, we're, we're hugely excited about this, this effort as well, and we recognize how important it is. I want to, um, I want to go to a couple of the questions sure. um, as we move into the space of um, how do we engage in this and, and how, do we, how do we shift our, shift our thinking. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie said, the idea of donors being stuck is real. Tulane, you are so spot on. Philanthropic advisors and peer learning groups help. Thanks for sharing your wise words with us. Um, there's also a question from Rosalind Payne. Rosalind, if you're there. <clears throat> Hi, Rosalind. Ah, oh, we get to see Rosalind. That's great. Hi, Rosalind. I, hopefully, I, I don't know whether we get to see Rosalind, but we hopefully get to hear you. Are okay. you there? Hello. Rosalind? Hello there. Hello. Hi. Hi. What's your question, Rosalind? So I'm here in Silicon Valley, and I've been involved with uh, we have a pain family foundation and I'm involved with a social enterprise and, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things, the challenges that I've seen here is a tendency in, for many of the philanthropic uh, community groups to only get three year funding mm -hmm. and to really make a difference. It seems to me that there has to be a much more sustainable commitment for change. And I was uh, wondering what your thoughts were as to how we might address that challenge. That is, that is the, you, uh, our thoughtful woman, Rosalind, that is a key question that, you know, and, and this is when we talk about that philanthropy needs to have a, uh, a tectonic shift, <laughs> right? That's what we mean. We, we have, but that's a charity mindset. Three year grant making cycles, I would argue are a derivative of a charity framework versus a transformative philanthropy framework. Because we know that you do not transform an outcome in three years. So I would offer that um, part of how you create a bridge between our sort of um, habit of short-term expectations for long-term propositions, the bridge is milestones. We have to get better in philanthropy at being uh, precise about the progress and milestones that we will invest in and value. We, 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 you know, so let's say, for example, there's a goal of uh, investing in a school district, you know, improving student outcomes in a particular school district. And you know, as a foundation, you have a three-year grant cycle, and that's how you've always done it. That's how it's always been. That's how it's written in your bylaws. And so there's a whole set of structure that makes it difficult to conceive of another way. Right. Um, well, the way that you bridge out of that into something that uh, offers more patient philanthropic capital is you get explicit about milestones of progress. So what is a realistic metric of success and impact three years in to uh, an education reform initiative for a particular district or school? Now, you don't create that milestone in isolation as a funder. You do what? you have a conversation with the proximate leaders who actually know the community, know the students, know the family, know the school district, know the city, know the neighborhood. And you develop, you co-design milestones that enable you to build progress trackers that give you confidence and comfort and reassurance as a funder and philanthropist, but don't put you in the position of imposing unrealistic, unsustainable outcomes for a grant that just is going to make the grantee tell you something that's not quite true or only tell you half the story. It just, you know, people are doing their best to meet these almost impossible benchmarks in time periods that we know are not doable, but we keep doing it because we've always done it that way. So I think it's really important to come up with progress 
trackers and milestones to do those in a co-design capacity with your grantees, with your community, with the stakeholders that you're supporting and investing in, and then to have that inform your grant making cycle. And that I found, I've seen foundations build milestones so that if they do a three year grant, then their grant is for something that's attainable in three years, as opposed to transforming an entire district in three years. So that's, I hope that's helpful, Rosalind. It's a really good question. I'm happy to talk more offline about some examples of how I've seen foundations do exactly that. That's a great, that's a great question. Thanks, Rosalind, and a great, a great answer to Lane. Thank you. Um, I, I, there's another question from Robert Collarina there, if, you, if you're there, Rob. Hi, Rob, how are you? Good morning. Well, can you hear me? We yes. can, yeah. Hey, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Juliet. Uh, Rob Colorina here. I'm I'm sheltering in the in the Mid Atlantic, and mm. I guess uh, uh, Tulane. I think I noticed that you had been involved with the U.S. Chamber out of Washington D.C. Mm. My my question um, is sort of geography related. Sure. Um, how do you um, how do you encourage um, uh, participation activity from the rural and sort of the non-urban centers to to be engaged and and, and do you have sort of internal metrics with your firm as to, you know, sort of portfolio allocation or resource allocation to, to that coverage? So that, that's my question. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Rob. It's a great question. We do. Um, we actually have a set of initiatives that are about building proximity to leaders and, and community members who are in the rural environments. Um, and so we have a, something called the Inclusive Impact Action Tank, where we convene 13 social impact leaders who collectively represent literally millions of constituents um, around different issue areas. And we're working with them on policy ideas that advance economic opportunity. On that action tank, we have folks who, like the, the head of the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky is a member of that action tank. And we have a subcommittee of rural leaders who come together and help us think about with any initiative that we're working on, how can we ensure that from the very beginning of our design work, we are weaving in considerations that impact people who are living in a rural space and in a rural, in a rural context, so that it's not an afterthought. One of the things that we sometimes see um, for urban centers and urban uh, uh, sort of philanthropy that's driven out of an urban context is that the rural consideration, the rural context can be sort of an add-on after sort of the main design work has been done. And so what we've been really committed to is not repeating that practice that we've seen in philanthropy by bringing rural leaders and organizers and just residents into our design. And again, it's all about proximate leaders as architects of your criteria, your programming, your success metrics. That's all, I'm always gonna fall back on that. That's always the answer. That's always the answer. And, and Tulane, there's um, the, the, the sort of big foundations and the sort of the wealthiest Americans often seem to dominate this space. Mm. For those on, the, on, on, this, on, this, um, on this webinar, how, how, how can their giving really achieve impact and how can they use their philanthropy to achieve real impact when it comes to racial equity? Yeah, well, listen, a couple things. <laughs> it's actually not that hard. It's actually not that hard. One is, you know, some of the, the, the name, the recognized names, you know, in philanthropy, um, people who carry incredible wealth and also have a lot of visibility. There's a combination. I'm, I'm noticing that you, you have a lot of both things. There's a lot of wealth and visibility coupled in, in a, a handful of the same people. Um, folks are watching what those folks do, right? Especially in philanthropy. And philanthropy tends to be a space where uh, we seek precedent. <laughs> you know, um, where we seek precedent. We want to know it's kind of okay to do this thing. Um, I encourage us to go beyond that. But, you know, again, if we're listening to proximate leaders, we will go beyond that if we're being guided by them. But if these, these folks that you're talking about, Juliet, um, to have even one of them initiate a portfolio that was architected and designed by proximate leaders, just that, the, the, the impact that would have on philanthropy, it would redefine it because we are so focused on precedent setting in philanthropy. Again, I think we have to move beyond that, but in the meantime, while we build that muscle, it would be transformative for leaders in that space, that in that specialized space that you described to actually model what I'm talking about, to build you know, a portfolio 
where there was no success metric that wasn't co-designed with community. Right. Where there might even be the removal of success metrics that they had, you know, hung their hat on in the past based on their pathway. When they, you know, they say, you know, we thought this was actually what mattered to advance student outcomes or climate change and environmental injustice, but we actually learned it's that. And so we're not going to prioritize this, um, you know, indicator in the way that we historically have. So to, to have that modeled by even just one of those folks that you're talking about that have, you know, um, unprecedented wealth combined with uh, significant visibility, that would change the game. And there was a great question from um, Jerry Roll at the start of this session. Um, J Jerry's at the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky. Jerry, absolutely. That's, hey, Jerry. Jerry is incredible. Listen, I have to give Jerry a shout out. The work that she is doing is phenomenal. Uh, Jerry is a member of the Inclusive Impact Action Tank. Um, reach out to Jerry, find out what she's doing, invest in what she's doing, support what she's doing. She's amazing. Uh, and, and her question was, how can we challenge big philanthropy to make deep investments, long-term, unrestrictive, supportive, and engaged? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say that, again, it's, it's not as hard as we make it. I mean, you know, have a conversation with Jerry Roll, get a sense of the landscape. We, the landscape around who's doing what in rural context, the, the data exists. We have all the data compiled, more data than you could ever need, right? So it, all it takes is a conversation with a rural leader like Jerry Roll to get a sense of the landscape. She's the kind of leader who is not simply looking for resources for herself and the institution that she leads. She wants to shift the trend of underinvestment in rural communities. So all you have to do is have a conversation with someone like Jerry to get the landscape. Once you get the landscape, then you know the onus is on you as the philanthropist to proactively reach out, build relationships, and learn. Um, to do it in a way where it's not burdensome to the folks who are on the ground working every day. Like you can't sort of say, hey, I'd like to learn, you know, give me four hours of your time with a week's notice. Like we can't do it in ways that are imbalanced. But find ways to meaningfully engage in and learn from people who are on the ground in the rural environment because proximity changes everything. Once you are in proximity to, to leaders, and community, you can't help but be transformed. Yeah. Right? So it's not hard. As human beings, we're hardwired. Once something is familiar to us, we're hardwired to trust it, to connect to it, and to be informed by it. That's how we're made. Our physiology supports that. So really, it's just about, as philanthropists, us making the effort to, with intention and respect, reach out to leaders who are in the issues and communities and geographies that we say we care about but say we don't know well. Yeah. It sounds like Rob should connect with Jerry on his question around geography Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, we're we're going to move into uh, on, into the last the last few minutes of this conversation. How we engage with each other, um, and mm -hmm. I do want to just do another poll to um, the audience around what issues you're most focused on in your philanthropy, because mm -hmm. this series is going to go deep into certain areas and we'd love to understand what issues you're most focused on in your philanthropy. So wh whether it's education, workforce transformation, democracy and civic engagement, healthcare, poverty, climate change, something else. Um, but yeah, please, please do share that because that will be interesting to us as we, as we build out this series. Um, and, and we know that the next session on this is, is going to be focused on education. Mm -hmm. um, this session will also be available for others to see. Uh, we'll share it on Worth and, and on, on New Profit. Um, so we will have a, a video recording of it as well for anyone that missed it. Um, while we're waiting for those answers, Let's talk about how we use our collective power and the power of community. Um, oh, here, here, here are the responses. Okay, so education is high. That's good yeah. because that's our next session. Um, <laughs> and then e equally, I'd be interested to know for those that put other, um, if you can use the chat box and just if, if you're comfortable, just share in what areas you're looking, that would be really interesting to, to understand. For, for those that are focusing on other issues with their philanthropy, what issues are those? Can I offer um, something, Julia? Can I just yeah. offer something quickly? The, you know, I want to say this. I think one of the challenges, I know, I don't mean to say I think, I know that one of the challenges we um, face in philanthropy is that we like things to be siloed across specific issue areas, right? Um, we, you know, I'm an education philanthropist. Climate change is my issue. I'm really about public health. Oh, well, I care about the criminal justice system. Now, what is true when you engage with 
proximate leaders is that you will find that uh, proximate leaders, because they are aware that their lives are impacted by multiple systems, they do not tend to operate in sort of a siloed way, but they don't, we don't live in silos, right? You know, we, we, if we're in, impacted by the education system and inequities there, we also are impacted by uh, issues related to economic opportunity and housing and disproportionate sentencing in the criminal justice system. Like we have one life, right? One life as a human being. And, you know, we live in one community based on where we're, what we call, where we call home. So one of the pieces that I think is really exciting for us to consider as philanthropists is what would it look like for us to create funding mechanisms that allow us to support holistic systems change efforts. What I've experienced and what I've seen and what we actually found in our research that we did for inclusive impact is that um, proximate leaders tend to design holistic models. So if they're in the student outcomes space, they also have a family engagement element because they go in knowing that if you're going to improve outcomes for a student, you have to also have some way to connect the dots to the experience of education in their household. They come in knowing that because they live it. But when they go to a funder, the family engagement piece is sort of perceived as mission sort of creep. It's not, it doesn't fit into a fairly rigid set of criteria for alignment and they, they don't get the funding opportunity. But they actually have the wisdom and expertise to know that student outcomes that are going to be sustainable and efficient must have some nod to family engagement. So that's meant to be an example of a dynamic that exists in philanthropy that I actually don't think is serving us, which is a sort of disproportionate prioritization of highly um, siloed grant making strategies that really proximate leaders bring intersectionality across systems because that's how people live. That's really, that's a, that's a, that's a incredibly helpful insight and I think it, 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 when we're talking about mindset shift I think that's a big one mm -hmm. um, a few people shared what other areas they're focusing on which is great criminal justice reform women's economic development um, gen gender equity women and girls empowerment um, violent prevention uh, focusing on issues access to capital for unrepresented groups systems change that intersects with multiple systems which is sort of what you were just touching on mm -hmm. um, civic infrastructure informing changing how philanthropy operates we i, I want to there's there's one more question i'd love to ask the audience um and, and then Tulane, i really want to just focus on your call to action and, and how do yes. we accelerate change in ourselves, in our sector, in our country. I know there was a question about how this applies to uh, outside of the US so um, mm -hmm. yeah. as well. Um, but, the, but the question we have um, for the audience, the final one is what do you feel you'd like to improve in your journey, in your philanthropic journey um, most? And, and, and that will kind of help us think about how can we, how can we support? So is mm -hmm. it a sense of community, strong, stronger data? Uh, more proximity to leaders and communities, which is what we were talking about, more learning opportunities, better understanding of policy issues, mm -hmm. opportunities to work directly with organizations. Um, so let's let's see what those answers are. And, and, and Tulane, uh, any thoughts on, I mean, I know New Profit is focused on the, U, on the US. Um, mm -hmm. Thoughts on how we can apply this model outside of the US and what others are doing in sort of Europe and, and, and Asia and further afield? Certainly. I mean, it is true. The U.S. Uh, the new profit is uh, U.S. focused. We have done some advisory work um, for philanthropies outside of the U.S. I personally have done some work um, mostly in East Africa and the Caribbean in terms of uh, where I've been exposed to what philanthropy looks like outside of the United States. And, you know, and I would say um, I, I do not mean to oversimplify. Um, However, there are some universal themes that, that play out regardless uh, in my experience and observation. Um, one is, you know, who is the, who determines metrics of success? That if you don't get the answer to that question, um, right and by right, I mean inclusive, that everything that comes from that mental model is going to be, you know, imbalanced arguably, right? So depending on the story that you have about where expertise resides, that informs your structures and that informs your results. And that is true no matter where you are. What I will say um, I've experienced certainly in East Africa that is different than the U.S. with philanthropy um, is that the idea that you would um, 
One, there's less infrastructure that you have to navigate to implement ideas. So in some ways, uh, I have found that it can feel like a straighter line um, outside of the US context where there is just such an infrastructure and industry of philanthropy, um, which, in, which creates opportunity, right? That creates opportunity. Um, there also though, at the same time can be uh, some resistance or questioning of the idea that it is inherently wise to invest resources so far outside of one's home, family, or community. So if I am a, a wealthy individual in Kenya, am I going to give my philanthropy to um, a child who is living on the street in Machakos? Or am I going to give my philanthropy to the person who is the chef in my home to help that chef cover his or her child's school fees? And so there's sort of a different set, different calculus that can operate outside of the US. And so it's interesting to sort of reconcile the lack of sort of um, industry barriers to implementation, to reconcile that with a different sort of calculus around uh, who, uh, who is worthy of, who should receive philanthropy or support. Uh, th this is fascinating and that the yeah. other piece is more cultural and so it's complicated but I, I, anyway that's just my sort of observations it's not sort of a strategy or proposal but it is to say that wherever you are starting with the mental models so that you can have clarity on the kind of systems that you want to see that no matter where you are that's the essential first and fundamental step in my opinion uh, and we'll bring um, we'll bring some of the these data points into the the subsequent series and um, pro proximity to leaders and communities and more learning opportunities and equity um, came out the highest. Tulane, this has been a fascinating first conversation on this subject. In the last sort of in the last thirty seconds, um, <laughs> what would be your advice on how we accelerate change in ourselves and in our country? First, um, tell the truth to yourself about where you've gotten attached to comfort and control, uh, interrogate it um, ruthlessly and be willing to adapt. Second is build proximity to the people and communities that you say you want to in some way uh, support, serve or, or change. And three is come join us at New Profit. <laughs> we really are inviting you. We're not telling you what to do. We are inviting you to join us in this work. Um, we've never before I said it, I said it earlier, I'll say it again and close on it. We have never before scaled support for proximate leaders in this country. We've never done it. I actually don't think it's been done in the world, but I can say with confidence it's never been done in the United States. And we actually right now, if just the folks here on this call decided that is what we're going to do, we could have a transformative result. And imagine if we multiplied that even more than this community. So tell yourself the truth, interrogate your comfort and control, and join New Profit. And, and, and join us for the rest of this series as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Elaine, th thank you so much. That was such an insightful and thought provoking discussion. Um, it was fantastic to have you open this series on re-architecting philanthropy, shifting our mindset um, and social entrepreneurship. And a special thank you to New Profit, Sam, Sarah, Lizzie, and all of the team there for being our partner for this series. Most importantly, thanks to all of you that joined us today and for your great engagement, for your great questions. We hope you enjoyed it. Please do share any feedback with us. We'd love to hear your comments on communityatworth.com. You can register for all the sessions in this series online at worth.com forward slash events. We'll also include it in the follow-up uh, email, which will also have the video link. Join us for the next session on Wednesday, October 7th at 3 p.m. Eastern time, which is focused on education, using a new lens to see and invest in transformative change in education with some great special guests. Um, so yeah, you can register online for that, uh, also for the Worth newsletters. In the meantime, uh, happy Friday, be kind, stay Bye. healthy, yes. uh, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day in the weekend. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Tulane. Thanks for being with us. Great to see you.